All right. Um, good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning Bible study. Um, as you may um, already be aware, we are looking at the Christian home. Um, but before we get to that, I want to remind all of you gathered um, elsewhere to continue with the protocols, um, the, the hand washing, the mask wearing, social distancing, just so um, we can control the spread of the pandemic. And so um, let's keep on doing this to protect one another from um, any infection. All right, with that out of, out of the way, um, I hope all of, all of you are doing well. I uh, hope God is keeping uh, his grace, his, his mercy upon us. And so before we begin, let's, let's start with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your grace, your mercy upon us. We thank you for loving us and sending your son to die on the cross for us. This morning being the Lord's day, the first day of the week, we have met to bring you a befitting worship. We have met to study your word, um, dine with you, and to show our love to you and to one another. We invite you into our midst. We pray that, Father, you would um, descend and, and take your seat and, and help us so that we can do everything with the right motives and with the right thoughts. We pray for all Christians around the world today. Please help us, energize us, and give us the, the right spirit, the right attitude, so that we can worship you and and have fellowship with one another. We thank you, Father, for all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you will do. We pray for wisdom, for insight, for world leaders as we battle with this pandemic. We pray that, Father, you help um, scientists who are working around the clock to, to come up with a vaccine. We pray for a breakthrough so that, Father, we will go back to, to our normal lives and to, with a renewed sense of commitment to you and to your work. We thank you, Father, for an answered prayer. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so last week and the week before, we have been talking about the fact that um, if we wanted to have a Christian home, if we want our houses to turn into homes, there are a number of things that we must do particularly preparing for marriage. So those who are preparing for marriage, we must be aware of our old nature and our old nature of sin, our old nature of selfishness, self-centeredness, and do whatever we can to discard that and, see, uh, and seek a, a new nature. Um, we must um, seek new ways of doing things. We must get over our materialistic, self-centered thought and all that. All these are very critical in preparing us for a Christian home. Um, you cannot get a Christian home without a Christian mentality and a Christian lifestyle. It will not work. And so a Christian home begins with us, the mindset, the lifestyle, and the behavior we get into um, marriage. Today we are going to talk about the fact that if we wanted a Christian home, if we wanted our, our houses to turn into homes, then we must uh, pursue new actions. We must pursue new patterns of, of behaviors um, so that that would lead into um, us having a Christian home. If my actions um, were motivated by um, um, noble motives, my, my spouse the same, then we, we are on our way uh, of, of developing and turning our house into a Christian home. Our children will learn from us and that will begin a positive cycle of generations of, of Christian homes. And so that is what we are going to uh, talk about today. Um, time allowing would also end this section by talking about uh, eight principles of, of getting a new nature, starting a new nature, and, and um, 
have that um, issues that are relevant to what we are discussing. And so let's begin our class uh, this morning in terms of how we can begin to accumulate for us, for ourselves, new repertoires of actions. How to change the way we act towards our spouses and others that would encourage and, and foster uh, a good home, a peaceful home, and a loving home. Um, the, the old self, the old nature, and its actions suggest that when our homes are not Christian, when our lives are not Christian, our actions toward God depicts that God is, God is dethroned in our lives. God does not occupy uh, the central seat in our hearts. And so we act as if we did not know God. And so we say things, we go to places, we don't go to places, we don't say the things we are supposed to say, depicting the fact that there is no God in our lives and we don't know God. And so when that happens, it affects um, the choices we make, the decisions we make, and all that. Um, let's read Romans chapter 1, verse um, 21, and listen to what the apostle um, Paul says um, in verse 21 he says so even though they knew God they did not honor him as God or give thanks but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened and so that's when we live according to our sinful nature the, the, the human nature we live as if we did not know God um, and we don't honor him in our marriage. We don't honor him in our actions. We don't honor him in the way we, we behave. And we do not give thanks to him. And so that affects the quality of home we develop, we build. When, when um, God is dethroned, God is um, external, God is a stranger to us. Uh, when that happens, um, it affects our actions towards um, others, our spouses, and even our, um, um, ourselves. You can also read Ephesians chapter 2. We have read this passage um, in this um, um, series. Now, since God is dethroned, self becomes enthroned, which means we begin to live for ourselves. We do things the way we want it, when we want it, and how we want it. And so that, that becomes our benchmark, our reference point, ourselves. And so um, the wife will be doing something on her own, and the husband will be doing something on her own, and that is what brings about the chaos and, and the um, anger and the conflict in the home. And towards others, do others before they do. That's the mentality. We, we, we do things to others to prevent them from doing that to us. And so um, um, we kill before we are killed. We hit before we are hit. We insult before we are insulted. That's the way we, we behave. Why? Because of our own nature. Because we live according to the dictates and the, and the precepts of the world. But... If we wanted, if you wanted a Christian home, if you wanted um, to to build um, um, a spiritual home, these philosophies, these ideas should not be the basis of your action. You should not live life with God dethroned from your life. You should not enthrone yourself as king of your own ship. Therefore, you do as you please. That will not work. And you should not be, um, you should not do unto others what you don't want them to do to you. You should not hate them first. That's not how we behave. But if we wanted a Christian home, first of all, we must love God. Our actions should spring out of 
a deep love for God. Uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 29 to 31 says um, something. It's, it's a very uh, popular passage. Um, when a question um, was posed to Jesus as to what the greatest command um, is, and let's listen to what Jesus' response is. Um, verse 29 says, Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. So, when preparing for marriage, our actions should be informed by a deep, total love for God. When God is the king of our hearts, is the king of our mind, is the king of our soul, and is, is the king ruling in our lives, when the love of God envelops us, every facet of us, it informs, it influences, it even determines the kinds of choices and actions we put forth. And so, whenever we want to say something to somebody, our spouse, our kids, our kid, if there is one, the love of God moderates what we say, our actions and choices. Because we love God, we will not do anything that is at variance with the love of God and with the word of God. And so, whoever is preparing for marriage must begin by learning how to love God and how to behave as a consequence and as a result of that deep-rooted and deep-seated love of God and for God. Next, after loving God, we must also have a love for self. And I need to be a bit careful about this idea of self-love and all that. Um, you cannot give what you don't have. If you hate yourself, if you're uncomfortable with yourself, if you self-loathe, you cannot demonstrate any kind of love to any other person. Our actions towards others is a reflection of our love for ourselves. And so, one of the things that anybody thinking about connecting himself, attaching himself with another person, to learn to do is to have an appreciation for him or herself. You must have some modicum of um, self-adequacy. You, you have a positive self-concept. You appreciate yourself, you love who you are, what you are, and what you are becoming. So that that would feed into how you 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 deal with others. If you don't mind saying nasty things about yourself, then you wouldn't mind saying same things about other people. And so, this is a, a very deep thing that we must um, learn how to, uh, to do, to, to, to act in positive ways about ourselves. To have a positive self-concept about ourselves. Now, I am not talking about being selfish and self-centered and self-conceited or self-absorbed, that you are the center of your world. That's not what I'm referring to. You know, there are some jargons and going self-love and I love myself and all that. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to um, a positive appreciation of self. Recognizing your shortfalls 
and appreciating your strength. Working on your weaknesses whilst projecting on your strength. You don't look at yourself in competition with others. That's not what I'm referring to. But I'm referring to the situation where we appreciate who God has made us into. That we are fearfully and wonderfully made and we were made in the image of God. We don't use the mirror of the world to de determine how we appreciate ourselves. Most women don't like the way they look they like the way they, they walk, the way they, they, they appear. Same with men and young people. And out of that self-loathing, we, we deal with others. We are always angry. We are always abrasive in our words. That, that speaks to a deep-seated self-hate. And you cannot build a Christian home with that um, uh, low self-esteem. You can't. And so... Once we love God, that love of God should lead us to begin to appreciate who God has made us into. That irrespective of how I look, my, my physique, my, my physical looks, I am created in the image of God. And I am original. That God wants, God gave me this persona so that I could, I can achieve his purpose in this um, world. So that, that when we are comfortable with ourselves, we are free to express love, to behave well towards God and towards ourselves and the people, the significant people that God is going to bring to our, uh, into our lives. So love for God, love for self, and then love for others. Uh, our love for God, our love for self, must reflect in how we express love, kindness um, towards other people. And so when we love God, which is the greatest commandment, when we love ourselves, which is common sense, the second commandment is that we love others, our neighbors, as ourselves. And so, because when you settle in a marriage, you are going to live in a community you are going to have in-laws. You are going to have um, um, acquaintances. So if you don't love God, if you don't love yourself, you can definitely not express any kind of love towards um, people in your community, people in your, um, in your locality. So it's critical that our actions are motivated and that guided by love for God, love for self, and love for, for others. That, that puts us on a path of, of a Christian home. Because the Christian home is not limited only to the atmosphere in the house, in your home, between you, your spouse, and your kids. No. It also um, is reflected in how you live with people in the community, how you treat other people um, um, that are close to you. And all of those actions must be motivated by love, unconditional love, sacrificial love, just as Christ um, demonstrated to us. And so that would bring this section to a close. The things we have to prepare for, how we need to prepare for, for marriage when if we, we desire to have a Christian home. We desire to create a Christian home. Now, if you have if you have any question regarding this section, you can post it on the comment section, and in, in due course, I would try my best to 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 respond to them. But let's go on to um, before we do that. I I nearly forgot this one. Now, how do we do all these things? God has provided for us an opportunity, privileges by which we can fulfill all these requirements. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. Paul affirms that God has not given us a spirit of timidity. Let's, let's read what the inspired apostle um, writes. Second Timothy 
1, 7. He says, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. So, the apostle affirms that spiritually we are not deficient. There is no deficit in our ability in terms of courage. That God has given us he says this in the negative, and I'm saying it in the positive. He says God has not given us a spirit of timidity. We suggest that God has given us a spirit of courage and of power. And he says he has given us a spirit of love. Which means, spiritually, we have the capacity to love God. To enthrone the love of God in us. To enthrone the love of self in us. The spiritual love of self. And the spiritual love of God others. Whatever we have discussed, what all the preparations that we need to make, we need to know that God has provided resources for us to be able to achieve that. As we have said, God will not send us on, an, on any errand, on any journey without providing resources. And so whatever we need to create a Christian home to prepare for sin, God has given us resources in the scripture. And so, with all that you have discussed, if you are wondering, hey, how can I do this? How, how can I achieve it? The answer is right before you. The resources for preparation towards marriage is here. The internal, the intellectual, the spiritual, all of them are, are in God's word. So you can shed off the old nature, you can shed off the old um, behaviors and you can uh, assume and, and cultivate a new nature, a new self, a new mindset, and a new behavior. God has given us a spirit. Um, Luke chapter 6 verse 38 is a, is a very popular um, um, passage. Let's read that and it will add to, to uh, the, the ideas we are, we are talking about. So, it's, it is easier to act yourself into a better way of feeling than to feel yourself into a better way of acting. What this says is this. If you, if you develop a new set of, a new repertoire of actions and thoughts, it is going to bring about, it is going to bring about a better way of feeling. In the marriage, you are going to feel good. There is always going to be joy and happiness. All because your actions are right. But if you want to feel, if you want good feelings to lead to better actions, forget it. And that's, that's, that's what most of us um, um, expect. We want to feel good so that we act good. It's, 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 it's um, um, I don't know how to put it, but it's illogical. It is our actions towards one another that, that brings about positive feelings, positive emotions in the marriage. So if we want to feel good in the marriage, if you want to be happy, if you want to have joy, then focus on the actions. Actions towards God, actions towards yourself and one another. That is what is going to engender positive aura and feeling in, in, in the marriage. So don't feel yourself to good actions. Rather, act yourself into good feelings, good emotions. So, and these young generation, oh, they feel it. Mm, that, that, that. You must concentrate on your actions. Your thoughts, that is going to engender the emotions you want, the, 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 um, the imaginations and your, the fantasies you have built about your marriage. It, if your, your actions are inconsistent with the happy home, you will not be happy. It is our actions that engenders our emotions. So don't... Those young people, stop, stop. You see, marriage is a real thing. It is not like the soap operas you have been watching. That, that should not be 
your, the way you, you, you anticipate marriage. If you want your marriage to be to work and to bring about joy, work towards it. Work on your choices, work on your actions. And that is what is going to bring about the, the positive emotion you see. All right. So now let's talk about eight principles for living the new nature. We've said that you must, you must pursue a new nature. Um, uh, um, separate or different from uh, the pre-Christian nature. So before you became a Christian, the nature that you are supposed to share, if you have shared that, how do you develop a, a, a new nature? And uh, uh, we are going to concentrate on Second Peter chapter one, verse five to eleven. And so let's let's read that passage, and then we can um, discuss. Um, um, the, the principles and ideas that the apostle discussed in the passage. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 11. The apostle writes, Now for this very reason, also, applying all diligence, which means diligence is required for us to develop a new nature. Remember, we said that there are no easy solutions. There are no easy solutions to a, a caterpillar changing into a butterfly. In the same way, there are no easy ways of, of a, a sinner becoming like Christ. We must go through the motions. We must shed some things off and put some things on. It requires diligence, hard work, every effort. He says, applying all diligence in your faith. Supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Amen. He says, for in this way, with these principles that we are going to talk about, the entrance to the Christian home, he says, the eternal kingdom. I am replacing the eternal kingdom with the Christian home. That God has prepared for us would be abundantly supplied to us. So, we creating a Christian home requires all diligence. Unfortunately, most of us we are always looking for the easy way out. We are the microwave generation. We want, we want marriages to be like um, 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 cold water or cold soup. You put it in the microwave, after a few seconds it is hot. It doesn't work again like that. So the Apostle Peter says that we, we must apply diligence. And so for us, to get a new nature, the nature that is required for entering into marriage that will lead into a Christian home. We need faith. And faith is a response to God's call to leave the old self. You see, without faith, the Hebrew writer says, it is impossible to please God. And so, without faith in God, 
you lack the capacity, the motivation, and even the ability to shed off the old nature and put on the, old, the new self. We, you see, Paul talks about when he was in the world, his former life, and all that he did. You see, he was motivated to share his former life when he became a Christian, when he, he formed the right faith relationship with God. And so those of us who are in the church, who are Christians, yet faithless, who are, who are Jews in name, but Gentiles by practice, who bear the name Christian, but are unwilling to do what is required, forget a Christian home. Faith is the foundation on which the Christian home is built. For your home to be Christian, you must be Christian yourself, and it requires faith for us to, to, to be called Christians. And so, the first principle for developing a new church a new nature is, is faith. You must work on your faith. You must develop your faith. Why? Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Whoever comes to God must believe that he is and that he so readily, eagerly rewards those who seek him. And so it is our desire to pursue God that motivates us to do the things of God in our homes. If you have no desire for God in you, then you have no desire to make a Christian home. So faith is a critical ingredient in, in metamorphosizing, in changing from a caterpillar into a butterfly. If you don't believe that that transformation is possible, if you don't have that faith that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly more, that's the end for you. And so faith is critical. The next one, faith is not enough. You need to be somebody who, who desires, who has an insatiable desire to be morally excellent. Somebody who wants to develop all the goodness in God. Somebody who wants to imbibe. Somebody who wants to reflect the goodness of God in his life and in his hope. And so, having faith is not enough to shed your old self. You must, as, as the deer pants for water broke. You must also pant, have an insatiable desire for moral excellence. And as you move towards moral excellence, you shed the old man of greed, of, of sexual immorality, of, of dissension. You shed them. It's just like moving from darkness into light. The more you get closer to light, the more you become distant from darkness. And so, having faith is not enough. We must move, add a new step towards moral excellence. So, faith, moral excellence, or goodness. Some person says virtue. The next principle is knowledge. This is not, knowledge is, this goes beyond mere accumulation of facts about God. That's not, a lot of people know things about God, but it doesn't, it has not changed their, their worldview and their, their lifestyle. So this knowledge is not a um, um, gnosis, gnosko, there's learning, no. It's, it's about the ability to discern God's will and to do accordingly. And so you must have faith in God. You must have moral excellence, goodness, virtue. But you must also have knowledge that, that helps you to discern the will of God in every situation 
Avoid that which is evil and cling to that which is good. This virtue, this ability is not, is not available to everybody. But if you are bent on shedding the old nature and assuming the new nature, you must have knowledge. You must develop this ability. And it comes. You can say this knowledge is in some way wisdom. Heavenly spiritual discernment. Just like the serpent, you are subtle, you are shrewd in the way you live, all because you don't want to be trapped so easily. And so you know how to choose your steps, you know how to choose your words based on the knowledge you have in God. So faith is not enough, goodness is not enough, knowledge is not enough. You must develop self-control. You must have the ability to say no to evil and say yes to that which is right. As I've alluded to, the world is always socializing us to find no value in controlling ourselves. And so they tell us, if you want it, take it. Some will say, just do it. Just do what? They will tell you, you deserve it. What do you deserve? You see, all this advertising mantra is meant for us to shed off the capacity to, to control self and to think before acting. But if you want to develop a new nature, you don't, you don't just do it. You know that you don't deserve anything. That is, that is the way you, dis, you, 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 you develop self-control. That you must do whatever you have to to avoid temptation. A Hebrew writer, uh, uh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says that if one eye makes you sin, Pluck it out in your right eye and if your right hand. That is, that is the, 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 um, the gravity with which we must resist sin. And this calls for a deep level of self-control. Not seeking to gratify the self, but always seeking to, to promote the spirit over the flesh. And by so doing, we develop, we share the old self and assume a new nature. The next principle is patience. Some versions will say endurance. Irrespective of what life throws at you. Irrespective of the withdrawal symptoms you experience. Because when you move away from the world and you become, you come into Christ, the world is going to maintain its pool. On you. It is going to try to bring you back. It is going to try to get you back. But you must endure. Satan is going to throw all that at you. You must endure. You must be patient in your difficult moments. When, when you, you think you don't see the hand, the, the, the movement of God in your life, you must hold on before you act. You must be patient. Spirituality is not always about self or instant gratification. Spirituality is always waiting upon the Lord. Even when his promises for us seems to linger or delay. So, patient. Uh, of course, these are all themes that we can develop long studies on but it is meant for you to begin your own your own reflection on these themes the next is godliness after endurance we must maintain godliness you see some some people 
will see somebody and they say, oh, this is a good guy. This is a good girl, good lady. You see, it takes more than goodness to build a Christian home. And you see, God is not looking for good people. God is looking for godly people. So it takes more than being good to shed your old self. God does not want you to be good. He wants you to be godly. And so we must, and godliness is trying to please God in every phase, in every situation, in every time. You want to maintain the relationship with God. And so we must, we must aim for godliness and not goodliness. So those of us seeking to share our old self, always ask yourself, is what, am I, is what I'm doing godly? As they say, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? And once what you want to do is inconsistent with what Jesus would have done, even though it might be good, even though it might be acceptable in the sight of men by society, but society is no more your standard. Your friends are no more your standard, but God is. So we must pursue godliness. You must, you must seek godliness. You must preoccupy yourself with achieving godliness all the time. Brotherly kindness. You must learn how to be sensitive and kind to others. You must not always seek your interest, but seek the interest of others. Psychologically, it is said that human beings are naturally selfish, but Christians are expected to be selfless. And so, we must always win the battle between selfishness and selflessness. Always tilting towards the right. Selflessness. He says love. Unconditional love. Agape love. The one that does good to others without expecting anything in return. The kind of love that is committed to others, whether they are near or distant. Love. Four letter words, but long definition, deep understanding. That is what we must pursue. In verse 8 it says, For if these qualities, if these virtues, are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless. You do not become a useless spiritual partner. You do not become fruitless as well. So, you know, sometimes you get married and you, 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 you wonder what you have gotten yourself into. You come to that conclusion if these principles, these virtues are not either in yourself or your spouse. But if these are in you, in your spouse, and they are increasing, you are always pushing for more, like Oliver Twist. You are not content with mediocrity, spiritual mediocrity, but you are pursuing for greater, bigger, better spiritual virtues. You become fruitful. Your marriage, your home becomes fruitful. Yes. For he who lacks these qualities, and in situations where couples, individuals lack these things, they are blind and short-sighted. Don't marry anybody who is blind and short-sighted, if that person is not having these qualities. Not, perhaps not, not at once, but if that person is not making any attempt to grow in these qualities, it will not work. Your marriage will become a blind one. And nothing good will come out of it. Verse 10, he says, Therefore, therefore, my brothers and sisters, be the more diligent to make certain about the, his calling. You see, if you want to be diligent about anything, not your wedding, not your wedding dress, be diligent about these qualities. He says, For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. But with these qualities, I assure you, 
whatever you seek in your marital relationship, whatever fa fantasies you have would be uh, uh, supplied to you. But if you don't have these, you can watch whatever telenovela you, you want. It is only going to be on TV. It will never translate into your relationship. At least not in a Christian home. The type that God commands us. Uh, how much time do we have? 13. 13. Okay. Do we have any questions? Well, um, by the time we have, we have about 13 minutes more. You have no question. So let's see. And this this is the last bit I am saying on this issue. Don't settle for B. In terms of in terms of faith, goodness, knowledge, self-control, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. Don't settle for B in any other, but strive until you make an A. It says if these things are in you and they are increasing, you may start off with a B. But you must not be satisfied. You must not be complacent. You must shoot for A. You must, you must go, pursue, seek until you, you, there is nothing for you to pursue anymore. And when that becomes your habit, your preoccupation, you are definitely going to shed off the old nature, assume the new nature, and become a wonderful complement to the life of somebody God may prepare for you. And your home will become a shining example, a replica of the heavenly home on earth. Now with all these things, and some others that we are going to discuss, it may be a mirage. The Christian home would be a mirage. So how to acquire the new nature? These are some ideas on how you can develop some of these nature. First, submit to God. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. And the life that I now live, I do not live for myself, but I live for Christ who died for me. So when you submit to Christ, when you crucify yourself through baptism into his death, when you are raised back to life, you realize that the life you now live, you don't live for yourself, but you live for Christ. Who gave himself up for you. Faith, since faith is the beginning of, of, of shedding the old self, submission to God is also the beginning to assuming and acquiring the old, the new nature. Let's read the other passage. Two, you must have a habit of regular self examination. See, the best form of examination is self-examination. So, whatever you are doing, ask yourself, and this is an inter internal dialogue that goes on. Why am I doing what I'm doing? What are my motives? Is it for money? Is it for fame? Is it for uh, self-aggrandizement? Why? And so, whenever you realize that your motive is not right, then it means your actions are also not right. Your actions may be right, perfect in the eyes of men, but if the motives behind them are wrong, they are wrong. Your actions are wrong in the sight of God. So always examine the motives for which you are doing the things you are doing. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, when Paul was speaking to the elders in Manitus, whilst he was on his way, leaving for Jerusalem, he says, take heed to yourself. And then to the flock upon which the Lord, Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And so Paul does not tell them to take heed to their flock, but he says, take heed to yourself. Self awareness, self introspection. If you want to shed your old self and acquire a new self, you must constantly be, you must be scrutinizing your thoughts and your actions. Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, while I was taking the last of it says, let each one examine himself. You know, there are some examinations that Wyatt cannot be responsible for. 
And in terms of your spiritual growth, you must be your own examiner because you know yourself better than anybody else. So take heed to yourself. Second Corinthians 13, verse 5. Just, we should examine ourselves. And so you must develop. You know, sometimes we master examining others, talking about others, reflecting others in the mirror, whilst we remain there. You do, you do yourself no, no good by examining others without examining yourself. So examine yourself. Develop that habit. Confess one another to one another. If you discover any wrong in you, any, any struggles you have, admit, accept to either your spouse or somebody else. Because without, I've, I often say this to my congregation, if a person is not declared missing, no such party is sent looking for that person. If you don't admit any shortfall in you, you can never change. If you doubt it, ask yourself. Some of us have formed certain habits when we were babies. But because of defensive thinking and excuses, rationalization, justification, we are 30 years but still steeped in that bad habit. Why? Because we have not gathered the humility and the courage to confess, to admit, to accept and acknowledge. That is what confession is. To confess means you admit, you acknowledge, you accept that God is right and you are wrong and you need help. So develop that habit of confession. If you are married, confess to one another. I did this, I'm, I'm sorry. And you learn confession and you learn how to forgive one another. Repent. Confession without repentance is nothing. Learn to change with small steps, add bigger ones, and change from whatever habit, whatever lifestyle that is inconsistent with your faith and the virtues you are developing. Pursue forgiveness from God. Once you confess, once you repent, ask God to forgive you. I don't. The passage in first born, first John. That's not saying you should perceive, uh, perceive from God. Because once you have confessed, Scripture says He is faithful and just to forgive you. So conversion and repentance would activate God's forgiveness. In this case, it doesn't matter where you, whether you feel forgiven or not. Once you have done what God you should say, you should do, you can trust that He's also going to do what He says He will do. So once you have confessed, once you have repented, God will forgive you, and then you must also learn to forgive yourself. Then ask the offended spouse for forgiveness. Ask your spouse to forgive you. And the last point is that repeat the steps from, from the, the top regularly. So regularly submit, often examine yourself, consistently confess to one another, always repent. Always perceive forgiveness and ask forgiveness from. And once you keep these steps going every day, very soon you will form a new habit, a new nature, distant from your old self. And then you are ready, you are, you are prepared to attach your life to the life of another person. And there is hope that you can create can have a Christian home. And your home, your life, will be a, a shining example to, to others. You will be an exhibit, evidence that God can use in his court to, to argue to people how it is done. Brothers and sisters, as we end, let us, let us always try to be like Job, that God can point to have you considered my servant Job? When we make an effort to grow spiritually, God can use us as evidence of individuals who are growing and are maturing and, 
and can be trusted to be a good, good ambassador of God in this life. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. I hope that these lessons will be useful to you. Um, whether you intend to get married or not, I hope there is something um, uh, of value for you in these lessons. God willing, next week, we shall begin talking about the, the husband that is needed in a Christian home. And so what is the role of the husband? And then we we'll proceed to talk about uh, the kind of wife that would make for a Christian home and all those things. So let's end here. Um, do we still have, do not have any questions? All right, that's fine. So for, for the sake of Adwa, uh, today um, this class would, um, would um, precede our family worship. And so for Adwa, Adwa Tindra, um, for your sake, we'll take the Lord's Supper so that you and I will take it. Then the family would, would, um, would take it afterwards. And so if you are ready, let's take the bread that stands for the body of Christ. And as he prayed over it, let's pray over the bread. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for setting this table before us and inviting us to dine with you, with your body as the many. We pray that you will sanctify it. We pray that, Father, it would be um, a valuable sacrifice for us as we are in your kingdom to live the way you expect us and to act the way you demand of us. We thank you so much for your son who was willing to give this sacrifice in, for our sake. In his mighty name I will pray. Amen. says that after the bread he took the cup and blessed it and also gave it to them. So we do say, let's pray over the cup, this cup. Father, we thank you for this cup that is filled with wine that stands for your blood that you shed for the forgiveness of money. Once we are in your kingdom, Father, we are Reminding ourselves of this great sacrifice you made for us. We pray that this wine would be a fountain in us and would, would remind us to live and to serve you and to serve others. We thank you for Christ who died in his mighty name have we pray. Amen. Let's give thanks for, for the meal. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come to your table and to partake of the meal. We, we bless you, we give you glory, honor, and adoration. We pray that whatever blessings there are, you pour upon us. Whatever uh, curses you, Father, and spare us from, I remind us always to do what is right to walk in your path. We commit ourselves into your care as we begin a new week. We pray that your light, your holy light will shine upon us and directing us towards righteousness and distracting us towards evil. Today and the weeks and the days ahead of us, let us seek all the more to please you. Let us seek to develop all these virtues so that Father, we will be a positive reflection, a positive image to the world. We thank you for Christ who died on the cross. We thank you for the church through which we have fellowship with you and with one another. In your son's name have we prayed. Amen. All right, so uh, this will end our first service. Thank you all for joining us. Goodbye and see you next week.